the first week of an introduction to paleontology with the Safe Cultural Heritage Group. I'm Jenna and I am your mentor for the next six weeks and in today's lesson you will learn what paleontology is and dispelling some common misconceptions about it, the fossil record and how fossils form, notable figures in paleontology, the geological time scale and phylogeny. So what is paleontology? Paleontology is, is described as the study of all ancient life. This excludes, however, the study of anatomically modern humans, such as ourselves, and our activities, as that becomes archaeology. There are many different branches, all usually interconnected with each other of paleontology. So the first is vertebrate paleontology, which is the study of organisms with a backbone, such as ourselves and the T-Rex. Invertebrate paleontology is the study of organisms without a backbone, such as the trilobite on the uh, top right. Ichnology, which is the study of trace fossils. Micropaleontology, which is the study of microfossils, such as um, foraminifera, um, pollen, spores, diatoms. Um, paleobotany, which is the study of um, ancient plants, as well as palynology, which is the study of these ancient plants, pollen and spores. Palynology also comes under micropaleontology. Um, so yes, we also have paleoenvironments, paleoecology and paleoclimates. So what are fossils? Fossils are the remains of ancient organisms preserved within geological strata. This could include skeletal remains such as bones, teeth, shell and sometimes even soft tissue. Um, it can also include tracks, trails, borings, eggs, faeces and impressions. They are usually found within sedimentary rocks, however there are examples of fossils being found elsewhere, such as permafrost. These fossils are from Alaska and Russia and these are perfectly mummified in a certain way fossils of animals. So we have the woolly mammoth calf, cave bear and a lion cub. So some common misconceptions about paleontology. It's all about dinosaurs is the first one. Uh, to some researchers, yes. To others, no. Um, some people don't like dinosaurs. Some people find other organisms more interesting. So it really depends on who you are. The dinosaurs in Jurassic Park are scientifically accurate. Um, for most of the part, yes. Um, however, the main ones that aren't accurate are Velociraptor, which would have been in reality the size of a turkey. So what they've done is instead of using the Velociraptor to make it look more scary, it used, they used its uh, relative called Dionychus, um, which is a lot larger. Um, fossils are always found as complete specimens. Uh, no, usually not. It's a very rare case when fossils are found as complete specimens. Um, it is nice when that happens, however, usually fossils are found either isolated or fully disarticulated. All organisms get uh, fossilised, so this is not the case. Uh, we have quite a poor fossil record, is what quite a lot of people say. So it's heavily biased towards certain organisms as well as certain lifestyles and environments that they live in. Mammals did not evolve until after the dinosaurs became extinct. No, this is incorrect as well. Mammals lived alongside dinosaurs. Um, during the Mesozoic. They were just a lot smaller. Paleontologists just dig randomly in hope. This was a big thing that I used to think when I was younger. I used to go, how do they know where to dig? So it takes a lot of careful planning. Um, so what we need to do is to look at areas where um, certain aged outcrops are and then we go there and try and figure out if there were any fossils there. Uh, paleontology and archaeology are the same. This is not the case at all. There is a specific cutoff point for when paleontology becomes archaeology and archaeology becomes paleontology. So, um, yeah, so we, you need to watch out for that. Also, um, the, a key one that I get to told all the time is, oh, so you're a paleontologist, you are just like Ross from Friends. This is how to annoy a paleontologist 101. Like, that is the key grievance that everyone gets. Um, we are not like Ross from Friends. Yes, we probably enjoy coffee as much as him, and that's about it in terms of that. 
<laughs> and I'll leave it there. Every Mesozoic reptile is a dinosaur, so this is not the case. So every dinosaur is a Mesozoic reptile, apart from the birds. However, not all Mesozoic reptiles are dinosaurs. So in terms of Mesozoic reptiles, um, this also includes um, marine reptiles and flying reptiles. So the marine reptiles include ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs and mosasaurs and the flying reptiles are primarily um, pterosaurs. All dinosaurs lived at the same time as one another. So no, there were three periods within the Mesozoic. Each one has a very specific grouping of dinosaurs. So um, a key one is T-Rex, for example, in the Cretaceous. You would never get a Stegosaurus with a T-Rex. Um, you're more likely to get a Triceratops with a T-Rex. Um, as Stegosaurus and T-Rex lived at very different times. And then finally, another big common misconception is it is all old white men, which yes, it used to be. However, there is a growing number of POC and women pa uh, paleontologists. So that's a really important point to remember. So how fossils form? Uh, first step is to die <laughs> in a good preservational environment. Step two is the soft parts such as muscles, skin and organs decay and, um, and or, or get scavenged upon, leaving behind any hard parts such as bone and uh, shells and teeth. Um, and then sediments build on top of the organism, putting a lot of pressure onto the um, layers above. This therefore um, like solidifies the sediments surrounding the organism um, and lithothize, which is what we call turning to rock. So whilst this is happening, the hard parts of the skeleton are replaced by um, minerals that also harden. So um, when you go to a museum, the like for example, the bones in a dinosaur skeleton are all rocks instead of bone. And then finally, through the acts of pro uh, the processes of um, erosion, weathering, as well as excavation, the fossil becomes exposed for collection by paleontologists. Um, so this is a flowchart of the fossilization processes that can occur to a fossil. Um, so it should be noticed, however, that all of these can happen into on one fossil. So, for example, um, permineralization can also happen with a mould and a cast. So these aren't just limited. So each one does not just occur on one fossil. It can be a numerous mix of processes. So the um, another key thing that everyone needs to remember during whilst being a paleontologist is the fossil record is heavily biased. Um, and these biases, biases can be taphonomic, which is the study of an organism after it dies, um, which include environmental and geological. So the environment in which a, um, an organism dies is a crucial part of um, how if it gets fossilised or not. Geological, uh, the age of the organism, also a key factor in um, whether or not it gets preserved. And um, the organism itself is, plays a major, major part into this. So um, the size of it, the anatomy, abundance of individuals, the geographical range and temporal survival in whole can cause biases. So, for example, if it's a smaller sized organism, it's less likely to get preserved than a bigger sized organism. Um, and also this all kind of plays into the preservation potential. So, um, yeah, that's right. Um, the anthropological biases are biases that are induced by us as humans. So this could include field bias, um, the acquisition, curation and preparation bias. So the acquisition is how the fossil came to us. Curation is how we store it or show it. And the preparation is how we would say, for example, we have a bone in a rock, how we would get that bone out of the rock. Um, alongside this, academic versus commercial collecting plays a big part of this. So academic collecting is done by professionals such as like my supervisor and 
um, what we would do is go out into the field, log everything that we can, collect everything and make sure that it's all collected correctly. Whereas commercial collecting, we don't get the same level of detail as we would do with academic collecting. So we don't know really what's, what strata it was found, where the location is. Um, and what it is, is for commercial collecting, they just sell them on to other people. Another key bias is parachute science. So this is where people who, for example, primarily Western, so um, European or American, go to less um, studied areas such as Africa or Asia and um, do all like collecting and science and stuff and then not include anyone local and then go again. As well as this um, study and pu publication bias, this plays a huge part of what organisms kind of get their names out there. So, um, for example, if we have a T-Rex and a trilobite, more people are want to go to study the T-Rex than the trilobite. And then on top of this, if you public, pub, uh, publish about T-Rex more than a trilobite, you're going to get more publicity with the T-Rex. Another key bias is uh, political bias. So we wouldn't go collecting somewhere that is a war, war zone, for example, just because it's not safe. And also um, it could mean that we lose vital fossil organisms. And then finally, on top of this, this is kind of a key thing for everyone. It's funding and obtaining that funding. So if you don't get the funding, you can't go and collect, basically. Um, so a key phrase that we use in paleontology is Lagerstaaten. It's German and Lager means storage and Starter means place. So together that means a storage place. Um, and usually it's a sedimentary deposit, however it can be different types of rock, that exhibit extraordinary fossils with exceptional preservation sometimes. And it's thought to represent a snapshot in time. There are two types of Lagerstaaten. Conservat, which in English means conservation, which is exceptional preservation and sometimes, quite often, soft tissue is preserved. Um, and then the second one is concentrat, which is a concentration in English, and that's where we have a high abundance of fossils and they're not necessarily exceptionally well preserved, however, they sometimes can also be exceptionally preserved. So a few examples of this. So we have um, quite a few examples of conservat Lagerstaaten, which include the Burgess Shale in Canada, which we will talk about in lecture two. We have the Solenhofen limestone in Germany. We also have Gruber Mesel in Germany and the Posidonia Shale in Germany, as well as the Green River Formation in the USA. We also have the Yixiang Formation in China. And then here's another example from the Posidonia Shale in Germany. And examples of conservat Concentrat Lagerstaaten include the Hunsrup Slate in Germany, uh, the Morrison Formation in the USA, which is a Jurassic aged um, fossil locality where we can get loads of dinosaurs from, Riversley, Australia, which is a cave deposit, and Rancho La Brea Tar Pit in the USA, which is a asphalt deposit where tar bubbles up to the surface and organisms get stuck, leading to a huge amount of organisms getting preserved, but also amazingly well preserved fossils because they're fully articulated. And here are just a few examples of Lagerstaaten on Earth. There are many, many more. However, these are just a few examples. So notable figures in paleontologists. This is, these are quite um, famous people. So Richard Owen, he coined the phrase uh, dinosauria, which means terrible lizard. Uh, William Buckland, he wrote the first account of the first dinosaur known as Megalosaurus. Um, George Cuvier is also known as the founding father of paleontology and what he did, he used um, this thing called comparative anatomy, so he looked at living organisms and then compared them to the bones of fossil organisms. Mary Anning, she um, found a load of marine reptiles, so ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, um, in Lyme Regis here in the UK. 
Um, she wasn't really recognised during her time on Earth. However, she's gained more and more popularity recently. Franz Nopska, he was a eclectic personality. If you want, I would definitely read up on him. He's amazing. <laughs> His life story is just great. And what he did is in Romania, he found a um, evidence of um, island dwarfism and gigantism in sauropods and a giant pterosaur known as Hatsagotrex. Uh, he named this island that was in Europe during the Mesozoic as the Isle of Hatzeg. And then finally uh, we have Cope and Marsh who were, who are extremely well known as the kind of leaders of the Bone Wars that happened in the US. So these are some more recent people who are quite big figures in paleontology. We've got Neil Shubin, he was one of the founders of Tiktaalik which is a key transitional fossil for, um, for the water to land transition, uh, which we'll learn more about in week three. Uh, we have Nizar Ibrahim, he was key in the uh, refounding of Spinosaurus because it was lost during World War II. Bob Backer, he was uh, extremely well known for his th um, for kind of refuting the idea that dinosaurs were slow, cumbersome, dumb animals. And he, he theorised that dinosaurs were actually smart, fast and warm-blooded. Uh, next we have Jack Horner and Steve Brissett. So Jack Horner, he is most well known for trying to uh, make a dinosaur out of a chicken. Um, <laughs> as well as his studies with T-Rex. He was also the chief scientific consultant for the first Jurassic Park. And then Steve Brissett, he is in Edinburgh University and he has taken on the role of scientific consultant for the newest Jurassic World. Tori Herridge, she is um, a TV presenter here in the UK and she advocates for women in archaeology and in paleontology and she focuses on the Proboscideans, which are the elephants. Susanna Maidman, she is a researcher and curator at the Natural History Museum in London, and she focuses primarily on stegosaurs and ankylosaurs. And then finally we have Yara Haridi, she is a paleontologist who studies the cells within bones, and what she does is she looks at the, um, these cells to identify metabolism, physiology, and um, the organism's life history. So next up we have the geological time scale. We use this all the time as a paleontologist. I have one stuck on my wall. Um, and I know this can look really daunting at first. So um, what I like to do is I like to explain it in terms of a geological clock. So what I do is I take it as a 24 hour clock. We can show key times and events in Earth's history. So the first being at 12 a.m. Earth forms. The first life, which is known as single cell prokaryotes, um, which you can't see under my, without me moving myself, um, evolve at around 3.30 a.m. At around 6 a.m. photosynthetic organisms first evolve. And then at noon, the atmosphere becomes oxygen rich. By 1 p.m. we have eukary eukaryotic cells. Um, at 4pm we have multicellular life emerging. At 9pm we have the Cambrian explosion which is what we will talk about in next week's lecture. Uh, at 10am, at 10pm sorry, <laughs> uh, animals start to move onto land. Um, this is following tree, uh, well plants moving onto land um, at around half 9pm. 1040 to 1140 dinosaurs rule the earth and then two minutes to midnight our evolutionary history begins with hominids branching off from the apes and then modern humans aka us arrive just as the clock strikes midnight. We also use terms such as eon, era, period, epoch and age. So Eon is the largest division out of the geological time and it comprises numerous eras 
and it usually kind of takes around a billion years. An era is the first order of geological time composed of several different periods, which consists of several hundred million years. So an example of era is the Cenozoic. A period is the second order of geological time and that's composed of a hundred million years or more. Uh, and an example of a period is the Quaternary. The third order of geological time is an epoch and that is tens of millions of years. And an example of the epoch is the Pleistocene. And then finally, age is the fourth order and that is around a, a million years or so. And that's an example of which is the Calabrian. So we have the Calabrian age of the Pleistocene epoch of the Quaternary period of the Cenozoic era of the Phanerozoic Eon. You may also hear the term crone thrown around. Um, this is an extremely small unit of geological time. And so finally, we move on to phylogeny. And phylogeny is the relationship between all life on Earth that has descended from a common ancestor. So it's often represented as a tree. And at the base of the tree, so the roots, um, you get your most ancestral lineage. And then as you move forward and up, you get their descendants. Um, and as you move up the tree, you are moving further forward in time. When a branch splits, it's known as a speciation event. Uh, there are numerous different types of trees. So this is one of which, and it is a monophyletic taxon. So this includes the most recent common ancestor and all of its descendants shown here, highlighted. This is also known as a clade. Um, an example of a monophyletic taxon is mammals, uh, well, mammalia. So a clade is a grouping which includes a common ancestor and all of its descendants of the said ancestor. So the top two are clades because they include a common ancestor. Bottom left does not include the last common ancestor, so therefore it is not a clade. And the same goes with the bottom right, it is not a clade because it involves too many different ancestral um, lineages. A paraphyletic taxon is a collection of organisms including the last common ancestor but not all of its descendants. Therefore it means that it cannot be a clade or a monophyletic group. Examples of which include the dinosauria and fish. And then finally, we have a polyphyletic taxon. Polyphyletic taxon does not include the common ancestor of all taxon members. So they're usually classed as unnatural and are usually reclassified to make them more natural and more like monophyletic or a paraphyletic taxon. So um, these are usually the product of convergent evolution. Um, an example of which is the flying vertebrates, uh, birds, bats and pterosaurs. These all have wings, which is a convergent evolution trait. So we're going to run through an example here, um, which involves humans, cats and butterflies. So cats and humans both have a backbone, whereas butterflies do not. This backbone is known as the synapomorphy, um, which is a derived or specialist character that has originated at their last common ancestor. So this backbone evolved at after the butterflies had evolved and at the last common ancestor between the cat and the human. Uh, DNA is shared between all of these creatures, so the cat, the butterfly and the human, um, and it is known as a plesiomorphy, which is an ancestral or primitive state or character. And then finally, butterflies have exoskeletons made of chitin. These are known as an apomorphy or an autapomorphy. An apomorphy is a derived or specialist character that is unique to that clade. And then um, a autapomorphy is an apomorphy unique to a single group. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. It will get clearer once you start to read more of them. Uh, that's quite a whistle stop tour of phylogeny. I mean, I could go on for hours about them. So I hope this makes sense. If not, please let me know. Uh, so here are some final further reading examples so uh, we have a bias in the fossil record kind of blog post as well as a decolonizing paleontology 
um, website. So um, that's quite a good read. Uh, we also have McLennan, uh, 2010, and that is how to read a phylogenetic tree. That's open access, so it means that you guys can have a read of it if you want to, and it's quite a good way of understanding how to do a phylogenetic tree. And then the bottom two are from Berkeley, over in California, uh, one of which shows um, different fossil processes, and the other is a phylogeny pro uh, glossary sort of thing. Um, here are the references for the um, text, for the images. Um, these are also included on the um, sheet with the further reading handout. And here are my contacts. So I'll be available and checking the online classroom most evenings around four to eight British Standard Times and weekends. However, these hours are most likely to change due to work commitments because I am a master's student as well as um, having a full-time job. Um, but I'll keep you all updated if this time doesn't work for me or let me know what works for you best. Uh, here are my socials as well, my Twitter, LinkedIn, website and email. If you um, want to contact me, the email is probably the easiest one to do uh, or just message me in the um, Google Classroom. So I look forward to seeing you all next week. Bye!